again, said the bacteriologist, slipping a glass slide under the microscope. Here's the bacillus of cholera. The cholera germ. The pale-faced man peered down under the microscope. Ah, oh, yes, said the visitor. Not so very much to see after all, little streaks and shreds of pink. And yet those little particles, those mere atomies, might multiply and devastate a city. Wonderful. He hesitated, scrutinizing the preparation. Are these alive? Are they dangerous now? Those have been stained and killed, said the bacteriologist. I wish, for my own part, we could kill and stain every one of them in the universe. I suppose, the pale man said with a slight smile, that you scarcely care to have such things about you in the living, in the active state. On the contrary, we are obliged to, the bacteriologist walked across the room and took up one of the several sealed tubes. Here, for instance, is the living thing. This is a cultivation of the actual living disease bacteria, he hesitated. Bottled cholera, so to speak. A slight gleam of satisfaction appeared momentarily in the face of the pale man. It's a deadly thing to have in your possession, he said, devouring the little tube with his eyes. The bacteriologist watched the morbid pleasure in his visitor's expression. This man, who had visited him that afternoon with a note of introduction from an old friend, interested him. It was perhaps natural, with a listener so evidently impressed by the lethal nature of his topic, for him to take the most effective aspect of the matter. He held the tube in his hand, thoughtfully. Yes, here is the pestilence imprisoned. Only break such a little tube as this into a supply of drinking water and say to these minute particles of life, which one can neither smell nor taste, say to them, go forth, increase and multiply, replenish the systems. And death, mysterious, untraceable death, death swift and death, terrible, full of pain and indignity, would be released upon this city to go hither and thither, seeking its victims. It would follow the water mains, creeping along streets, picking out and punishing a house here, a house there, where they did not boil their drinking water, slipping into the wells of the mineral water makers, get washed into salads, lie dormant in ices. It would soak into the soil to reappear in springs and wells at a thousand unexpected places. Once started in the water supply, and before we could ring it in, it would decimate the metropolis. <laughs> He stopped abruptly. But it is quite safe here, you know. Quite safe. The pale-faced man nodded. His eyes shone. He cleared his throat. These anarchist rascals are fools, blind fools, to use bombs when this kind of thing is attainable. I think a gentle rap, a mere light touch of the fingernails was heard at the door. The bacteriologist opened it. Just a minute, dear whispered his wife. When he re-entered the laboratory, his visitor was looking at his watch. I had no idea I had wasted an hour of your time, he said. I ought to have left here by half past three, but your things were really too interesting. No, positively, I cannot stop a moment longer. I have an engagement at four. He passed out of the room, reiterating his thanks, and the bacteriologist accompanied him to the door. Then he returned thoughtfully along the passage to his laboratory. A morbid product, he said to himself. How he gloated on those cultivation of disease germs. A disturbing thought struck him. He turned quickly to his bench, then to the writing table. He felt hastily in his pockets, then rushed to the door. Minnie, he shouted. Yes, dear, came his wife's remote voice. Had I anything in my hand when I spoke to you just now? Nothing, dear, because I remember... Blue ruin! cried the bacteriologist and ran out into the street. Minnie, hearing the door slam violently, ran in alarm to the window. Down the street, 
A slender man was getting into a cab. The bacteriologist, hatless and in his carpet slippers, was running and gesticulating wildly towards him. One slipper came off, but he didn't stop to get it. He's gone mad, said Minnie. It's that horrid science of his, of course. He is eccentric, but running about London in the height of the season, too, hatless and in his socks. A happy thought struck her. She knew what she must do. Some few minutes later, a little group of cabmen that collects around the cabmen shelter at Haverstock Hill were startled by the passing of three cabs driven at breakneck speed. The passenger in the first was not visible, but out of the second, the occupant leaned, waving and shouting and urging the driver to greater speed. The third contained a woman carrying various articles of clothing. The cabs whirled on down Haverstock Hill and Camden Town High Street. The man in the foremost cab sat, crouched in the corner, his arms tightly folded. The little tube that contained such vast possibilities of destruction gripped in his hand. His mood was a singular mixture of fear and exultation. Chiefly, he was afraid of being caught before he could accomplish his purpose, but behind this was a vaguer yet larger fear of the awfulness of his crime. No anarchist before him had ever approached this conception of his, how brilliantly he had planned it, forged the letter of introduction and got into the laboratory, and how brilliantly he had seized his opportunity. The world should hear of him at last, provided, of course, he escaped his pursuers. How fared the chase? He craned out of the cab. The bacteriologist was scarcely 50 yards behind. That was bad. He would be caught and stopped yet. The cab swayed suddenly, and the anarchist put the hand containing the little glass tube on the apron of the cab to preserve his balance. He felt the brittle thing crack, and the broken half of it rang as it hit the floor. He fell back into the seat with a curse and stared dismally at the two or three drops of moisture on the apron. He shuddered. Well, I suppose I shall be the first. Anyhow, I shall be a martyr. That's something. Presently, a thought occurred to him, and he groped between his feet. A little drop was still in the broken end of the tube, and he drank that to make sure. It was better to be sure. At any rate, he would not fail. Then it dawned on him that there was no further need to run away, so he told the cabman to stop in Wellington Street and got out. He slipped on the step, and his head felt queer. It was rapid stuff, this cholera poison. But he greeted his pursuer with a defiant laugh. Vive l'anarchy! You are too late, my friend. I have drunk it. The cholera is abroad. The anarchist waved him a dramatic farewell and strode off towards Waterloo Bridge, carefully jostling his infected body against as many people as possible. The bacteriologist was so preoccupied with the vision of his departure that he scarcely manifested the slightest surprise at the appearance of Minnie upon the pavement with his hat and shoes and overcoat. Oh, very good of you to bring my things, he said, lost in contemplation of the receding figure of the anarchist. Then suddenly, something grotesque struck him, and he laughed. Then he remarked, it is really very serious, though. You see, that man came to see me, and he is an anarchist. I wanted to astonish him, not knowing he was an anarchist, and took up a cultivation of that new species of bacterium I was telling you about, that infest, and I think, cause the blue patches upon various monkeys. And, like a fool, I told him it was, uh, Asiatic cholera. And he ran away with it to poison the water of London, and he certainly might have made things look uh, <laughs> blue for this civilized city. And now he's swallowed it. I don't know what will happen, of course, but uh, you know that uh, it turned the kitten blue and the three puppies in patches and the sparrow. Brian Blue.